Good evening, everybody. Ian, I just sent you a, a, um, a phone message. I didn't get the link till about a minute ago. Is that, am I crazy? You didn't get what? The Zoom link until about a minute ago. No, that's that's about right. So I mean, I'm serious. Yeah, I, I have the sun coming in on my nose. I'm sufficiently vain. Let me pull a shade. All right, go ahead. Sorry about that. Lisa and I got confused which one of us was sending it. And it was apparently me. But it's the same one as the last few. And it will be the same link um, into the future here for a while. Oh, well, that's helpful to know that, Jeff. Thank you. No problem. Are we short members here? We are. We're short, we're short five, to be precise. And hopefully we're going to make it up to four. We should. Well. Looks like Jeff Blackwell's head looks a little different there. Mark, it's Leo. I, I think I know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> the ID yeah, says Jeff. The we, ID we says just, Jeff Blackwell on it, Leo. Yeah, we just have one computer with uh, Zoom and the camera, so it was set up with Jeff. But I get mistaken all the time. <laughs> no Jeff, harm, Jeff's, no much, Jeff's much younger than I am. Oh, well. He has white hair, too, I think. Yeah, he does. He's getting there. Hey, Mike. Uh huh. Are we gaining? We are. We have a quorum. So on that note, let me see. It, it's 502. Welcome to the Thursday, October 6th Nantucket Conservation Meeting. As a preliminary matter, our chair, Ashley Arisman, is away, so as vice chair, I'm taking her place this evening. Joe Pandowski is also unable to attend the meeting, and at the moment, Linda Williams is not present. Permit me to confirm that all members who are present can be heard. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mark Beal? Aye. Seth Engelborg? Here and I have full faith in you. <laughs> Me too. Uh, the eternal optimism of youth. <laughs> Mike, Mike Mazzarelli. Hi. This meeting is being held entirely remotely, so all participants are participating via Zoom. The public may participate via YouTube. There are directions on the Times website as to how to join. If anybody wishes to speak, please raise your hand either in your camera window or virtually and wait to be recognized by the chair. Please state your name and any relationship you might have to the project before speaking. Please keep your device muted when you're not speaking so that you're not picked up by the recording or creating a distraction. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So we'll start the meeting with public meeting, public comment on items not being heard this evening. RJ. Thank you, Chair Golden, can you hear me? I can. Thank you, RJ Turcott, on behalf of the Nantucket Land Council, I have a request and a question for the commission this evening. Uh, my request is again that um, the commission put on an upcoming agenda 
the stormwater issues for the properties downtown that are having trouble maintaining their stormwater infrastructure. And second is a question. Um, I know there's going to be discussion of regulatory updates uh, at the end of the meeting on the agenda. And I just was curious whether any of the edits include the province town regulations that are on the draggers, because I've had a couple of phone calls this week referring to that and asking about it now that uh, the commission's scheduled for October 20th. So just curious if uh, that'll be on the docket. I missed the last regulatory update actual meeting. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, do you, would you like to respond? Sure. So we have scheduled um, for the stormwater issue, we have scheduled um, the owners of that lot to come to the meeting on October 27th to talk to them in person about it. So that'll be on that agenda for the next meeting. Um, to the second part, the Provincetown dragging regulations. We've talked about that a couple of times with those guys. That was brought forward by like Ray DaCosta and Pete Kayser. And those guys, we asked them for some additional information a while ago, and they said they were trying to get it together and, and do it. I'm sure they spoke to you because they always are looking to drum up as much support as possible. But uh, hopefully they'll have uh, some of the questions from the last time it was discussed uh, for the board in advance of the meeting on the 20th. But hopefully that answers both of those. So um, moving on from uh, public comment uh, to public hearing notices of intent. So we have a number of continuances. Uh, Brand Point Club LLC, 68 North Beach Street, 4, 4 Dolphin Court, continued to October 27th. And Tuckett Islands Land Bank, 32 Western Avenue, continued to October 27th. Boardwalk LLC, 90 Washington Street, continued until October 27th. And then in amended orders of conditions, Phillips. Excuse, excuse me, and uh, Leo Azadorian. Uh, I emailed the commission this morning and I would like to hear Boardwalk LLC. Oh, okay. Uh, sure, by all means. Yeah, like that's fine. Not, Sorry. Like that just got missed, Mark, but the posting online is correct. Yeah. Sorry, Leo. Okay. Thank you. So, um, under amended orders of conditions, uh, Phillips Trustees, 19 East Tristram Avenue, is continued until October 27th. Uh, Stark Point LLC, 16 Easton Street, continued until October 27th. And 41 Monomoy Road, LLC, 41 Monomoy Road, continued to October 27th. And then under public meeting, orders of conditions, Sunset House LLC, 15 Hallowell Lane, is continued until October 27th. So the first NOI in front of us is Boathouse Realty Trust, 52 Warren's Landing Road. I think you're, muted. Lee, you're still muted. Sorry about that. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Ian, can I ask a point of order question? Please. So the uh, order of conditions, Boathouse Real, or the 15 Hollow Lane that was continued, that's at the request of the applicant? That is um, correct. I, that is correct. So we, we're still fine on the number of days because they're they're consenting to that. Correct. Right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for clarifying that. So uh, Mr. Leahy, you're muted, I think, still. No, you're still muted, I believe. Uh -huh. Aha. The there we go. I found the button. <laughs> Excellent. This is just an application to uh, do a bit of beach nourishment. Um, you have the papers, I assume, and, and uh, the pictures which I provided. 
Um, the uh, area is in a bit of beach which is slowly uh, growing, but the particular part that I'm concerned about um, was basically damaged badly by a wrecked boat that was that laid there a couple of winters and killed the grass. And um, so that has lost sand and needs to be replenished. It's that simple. The boat is gone. <laughs> um, Jeff? So we had asked at the last time we were looking to figure out a volume of nourishment material that needed to go in place. Um, and Lisa and Mr. Leahy, and then we double checked it again. It looks like it's going to need about 450 cubic yards of material to go in. That'll be sourced um, on island with the uh, sand compatible to the actual beach in this case in that area there. So um, I know we'll be helping Mr. Leahy work with the uh, on island providers for that to, to get that sediment matched um, at the time of work for what's exposed and what's there but I know the volume of sand going in was in question last time, but it looks like it's gonna be right around 450 cubic yards. Thank you. And Those, just to, to uh, clarify too, because I know uh, Mr. Leahy's doing this themselves and, and, and trying to do it is that volume of sand goes essentially in a kind of a, a stable slope from the top of the existing wall um, just down to the beach at grade, and then that area will be replanted with, with the beach grass. Great. Correct. Um, any questions from commissioners? Seth? Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Leahy. I know this can be difficult to do on your own. Uh, I did ask also last meeting about a construction protocol, what type of equipment is going to be delivering the sand, what type of equipment is going to be spreading the sand on the beach to you, or does the town NRD staff have any of that information? I haven't retained a contractor yet, so no. So but I can tell you by experience decades ago in the construction business, um, it'll be a couple of big truckloads and it'll have to be a small, uh, pusher of some sort to spread it out evenly and taper it down to the uh, beach. So we we spoke to, oh, I didn't just laugh at, we spoke to a couple of the folks that do this work and we think the smartest way to be conditioned that the material be deposited at the end of there's the small parking area of Warren's Landing Way and then just move by Bobcat and place such a small load that they'll be able to do that pretty quickly. Exactly. And, exactly. and they can plant grass. And do you have a follow-up, Seth? Yes, thank you. And that's all fine. And I, I think we can condition it or have staff review to make sure everything's fine. You know, I think we also, before the start of work, uh, need a, a planting plan showing I know it's all beach grass, but, you know, number of plugs, si uh, spacing of plugs, size of plugs, things like that. We ask for that in all of our applications, so it's only fair. We can provide that, but realistically, I hope that some measure of grass that's now there will do what it usually does, which is come up through the sand. So, um, Mr. Leahy, when you did I mishear you when you said 450 cubic yards? Did you mean 45 cubic yards? I didn't okay. say enough. That's no. just it sounds high to me. What 45? 45 sounds more realistic, yes. Cubic right. yards. Right. That would be about two to three truckfuls. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. It is 45. You are correct. Okay. Sorry, I <laughs> skipped my decimal point in there. Sorry, guys. That's uh, those decimal points. It's about two. It's about two and a quarter truckloads of sand. Yeah. Right. Right. 
It's 50 feet long and about 20 feet wide and runs from three feet high to zero. If you're good at geometry, you can figure that out. Okay. I'm not. So, um, any other questions? Or is there any input from members of the public on YouTube, Jeff? All good. I don't have it up and running. No, no comments. Uh, Mark? I move to close the hearing. Do we have a, a second? Second. Um, by by roll call vote. Um, Mark Beal? Aye. Seth Engelborg? Aye. Mark Mizzarelli? Aye. And I, I assume, Mr. Leahy, that you wanted to close the hearing. Yes, indeed. Okay, excellent. Okay, so um, yeah, for the record, Ian, you need a vote. you need a vote. I thought I thought we just had a vote. No, you you need to vote. You need oh. to voice your vote. <laughs> oh dear, how embarrassing! Thank you, Seth. Ian Golding, I, and uh, and I didn't ask Jeff if we had everything we needed to close because I assumed that we did. You do and your close was fine. Okay, great. I don't Thank you, Mr. Leahy. I don't get a vote, but a vote of thanks to Jeff for his help on this matter. No problem. Anytime. Well, gets lots of votes of thanks from all of us. So, all right. So um, the next order of business is uh, the Land Bank, 16 East Creek Road. Rachel. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Rachel Freeman. I'm here representing the Connecticut Islands Land Bank. And we are proposing to turn our knotweed at 16 East Creek Road, um, which is a small property uh, on Nantucket Harbor, adjacent to the Creek's wetland system. It's approximately 0.31 acres, and it was purchased as a vacant lot in 2010. Since that time, um, it has basically been maintained as a dirt parking area with a split rail fence and installed uh, a brick walkway and patio to allow for ADA accessibility. And um, there is a small area um, of knotweed on our property, which we would like to begin to tackle. Um, the resource areas on the property also include salt marsh, bordering vegetative wetland, and adjacent to the property in, on the neighbor's property is uh, the very edge of a coastal bank. Um, our mechanisms for treating Japanese knotweed are variable. At this point, we trend to take a bit of an IPM approach where we do what seems to make the most sense in the area. Uh, we would begin with repeated cutting at this site and then likely treat it with a two to 3% mixture of um, you know, a glyphosate product and a citrus baked surfactant which is traditionally done sort of towards the end of August. Um, and we have actually found that in some areas when we get to very small amounts or small numbers of plants or small, small, small plants, we do tend to hand pull or just repeatedly cut. So um, we're requesting permission to basically use variable techniques as we determine appropriate um, at this site over the course of time in an effort to manage and, you know, hopefully eradicate this area of Japanese knotweed. I'm happy to answer any questions if the commission has any questions. Any questions? Mike. Thank you, Chair Golding. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Um, just on uh, procedure, you said the end of August, I assume you're doing that uh, in conjunction with it, with the not weed flowering and easier to kill at that time? We usually try and do it when it's drawing resources back down into the stems. 
Um, so we may have missed our window this year, which is okay, but um, we're, we're trying to really just <coughs> find up. We, so we likely will do another cut this year and then take the opportunity next year to treat it. Okay, and then um, what do you use for your glyphosate product, the uh, water base? We um, we don't we don't use a premix solution. We purchase um, basically what's functionally known as rodeo, um, which is a I believe it's around thirty four percent glyphosate solution. Um, and that is just the active ingredient with not much else in it. Um, and then we mix in our own surfactant. So we try, try and start with something that has primarily water. And yes, that's what we add is water to dilute it to two to three percent. Thank you. I believe I'm pretty sure Rodeo is, is the water based product. So that sounds that sounds right. Thank you. And we do add more water to dilute it. Great, thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Rachel? Any public input, Jeff? No, sir. Uh, uh, Spruce? Mr. Balkine, is that your hand up? Yes, yes, it is. I had a question for Rachel, if it's, I'm allowed, Mr. Chair. Of course. Um, I noticed um, that there was an area that was cut. Um, I don't know if it was the summer or late spring, but it made the burning a lot better. But I don't know if that was part of the program. It was down by the water near the gray area you indicated on your, um, on your treatment map. Um, I do not know if... You are, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if I'm gonna answer this question accurately. Um, we, there are properties that we historically um, manage in the winter to provide additional access um, or, or view access. Um, and we have a list of those that we're allowed to do that on um, one of them. So I'm not sure if that's, that's what we are referring to or not. Um, a little bit of off-season management more so. Um, if it then would have to go to the book directly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure when it was exactly cut, so I don't wanna um, misspeak, but okay. I did notice it this spring. So it could okay. have been cut in the winter, but it was just as you're standing like where the bench is and looking yep. out over the water, Mm -hmm. There was like a, a nice, um, it was mowed down the um, brush there. I didn't know if this was part of the treatment program. It sounds like it wasn't. It sounds like it was part of your, your winter cutting program. So yeah, that's okay. more like, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to close, Rachel? Yes. Jeff, do we have everything we need to close? Yes, you do. Would someone like to make a motion to close? Motion to close. Second. So um, by roll call vote, uh, Mark Beal. Aye. Seth Engelborg. Aye. Ian Golding, aye. Mike Mizzarelli. Aye. Great. So and that moves us on to the next one, which is the Land Bank 21 Grove Lane. And you're on again, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, again, Rachel Freeman from the Nantucket Islands Land Bank. And we are here with a notice of intent to request um, additional permission to <laughs> treat invasive species. Uh, this property here is approximately, um, I'm, I'm trying to think, I think it's like, it's a little over a acre. Um, do, do, do. I'm going to have to figure that out, but um, it's a little over one acre. It's 1.7 acres. That's what it is. And it's um, mapped at 21 Grove Lane. And currently it is not um, a property that's used for anything other than passive recreation. People do do a fair amount of bird watching in the area. Uh, it's bordered by residential properties to the north and west. Um, and a cemetery the east, and uh, it has a very large uh, bordering vegetated wetland 
that is um, over the bulk of the property. One thing that has come to our attention here is there's an area of Japanese knotweed, sort of a small area of Japanese knotweed on the northern section. And, uh, but the rest of the upland is um, actually has quite a bit of tree of heaven in it, which is not something that we encounter very often on Nantucket, but it is something that um, I've been made aware of as not a beneficial plant and has a lot of capacity to spread. And so this was something that we wanted to treat as well. Um, we do not have any experience treating Tree of Heaven, but it does appear that a lot of people have. It is definitely on the Massachusetts invasive species list and um, there's uh, ways to do it. And it seems like most of the ways that people are, are treating it are through applications of herbicides to bark. Um, and that's something that we're proposing for this plant as well. Again, we're, you know, we're sort of like the Japanese knotweed. And um, as I just described in the last notice of intent application, we're looking for a bit of a, a flexible IPM program where if we don't have to use herbicides, we don't use herbicides. Um, you know, we much prefer to hand pull, hand cut. Um, there is, it is likely that at some point we will be taking down these trees, um, hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then perhaps not necessarily using herbicide going forward. So it's a, it's a really a combination of mechanical management and herbicide treatment to control these, these plants. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions on this application as well. Um, again, it's for Japanese knotweed and tree of heaven. Oh, and I almost forgot there is actually quite a bit of debris in the entryway um, that we would also like to get rid of. Any questions? Mike. Thank you, Chair Golding. Um, not so much a question, but just a, a recommendation for, for Rachel. Randy Prostak at UMass is, um, she's a universal weed geek and he's a great resource to talk to with. I'm not, as I, I'm not familiar with Tree of Heaven and how to eradicate it, but he's always a wealth of knowledge when it comes to, to uh, control and I suggest you reach out to him. You might be surprised on uh, what information he would have on it. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, can you please repeat his last name? Yeah, Prostak, P-R-O-S-T-A-K, -P Randy. Okay, thank you so much. That's very helpful. I appreciate that. Great. So Rachel, as is it respecting the property line with the cemetery or is there a tree of heaven on the other side on the, in the cemetery? As of right now, it's respecting the property line, but um, you know, we, we don't necessarily want to share. So um, yeah. we're, we're trying to be a little proactive. Right, right. But so hopefully then you, if, if you're successful, then you won't have to deal with interlopers. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Seth, did I see your hand? Yes, thank you. There isn't a lot of tree of heaven on the island, but it's almost all concentrated in this area, like around the prospect, um, Hill, of, Hill um, Cemetery, Mill Hill Park, uh, Grove, Grove land, somebody must have planted it there at some point. And thank you very much for getting rid of it because it is a super bad invasive tree. And it's also the primary um, host species for spotted lanternfly, which we don't have on Nantucket and hopefully we don't ever have on Nantucket, but getting rid of tree of heaven minimizes the probability of getting lanternfly, so. I can't thank you enough for taking those trees down. Thank you for pointing that out, Seth. Yes, that that was part of our rationale here. Um, we, you know, to start picking away at the species. Uh, 
Jeff, any public input? No, but I'll just throw my two cents in. As someone who, you know, worked and started my career in Indiana where Tree of Heaven is a real problem, it, it's a real nightmare if it gets going. It just spreads like crazy. Um, and aesthetically, too, it smells terrible. It's <laughs> the worst. So the sooner they can get rid of it, the better. And once it, like, once it starts, it just spreads super fast. So... Um, if they didn't mow that cemetery, I guarantee you it would be in there already. It just goes. Oh, so good. Better luck. close the. Oh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I guess Seth, uh, is this a, or maybe Mike can help me. Is this a, a sumac tree? Is this related to sumac? It, it looks like sumac, but it's not botanically, taxonomically closely related whatsoever. Looks like it to me, but I, I yeah, guess yeah, it's got similar leaves, but it's in a different different family altogether. Well, given all the problems that come with it, I we better close the hearing as quickly as possible, right, Rachel? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> well, so move. Okay. Second. Second please. Okay, so by roll call vote, um, Mark Beal, aye. Seth Engelborg, aye. Ian Golding, aye. Mike Mizzarelli, aye. Great, thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. So um, uh, we now have uh, Boardwalk LLC, ninety Washington Street, and Leo. You hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, the application uh, that you have before you is for some alterations for an existing dwelling at 90 Washington Street. Uh, everything that's shown on the plan is there right now. So I'll just walk you through the uh, different uh, changes uh, to this building itself. Uh, the porch on the street side uh, is being altered. Uh, the steps are being altered. Uh, they're going to be narrower uh, across the face of the building. Uh, there's also a addition, uh, 117 square foot addition. The house is going to be pushed out to make the kitchen and the foyer uh, a little bit larger. Uh, on the water side, uh, there's changes to the deck. Uh, again, the width across the face of the existing building uh, will be narrower. And uh, we're not going, obviously not going any closer to the bulkhead. We're maintaining the existing 23.9 uh, feet uh, separation. And I, I should say that uh, I was involved with the construction of this building uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, and it's on piles, uh, Greenheart piles. And uh, it's pretty substantial uh, construction at the time. Uh, on the north side of the building, there's an addition of a fireplace that's going to take up about nine square feet. Uh, this is an existing HABAC units in that area that need to move to the northwest slightly in order to fit the fireplace in. On the south side of the building, there's just an addition to a wood walkway. There's a walkway right there uh, as it exists right now, but it'll be widened slightly uh, to give more people room to, to walk by. Uh, the stairs on the southeast corner of the porch are going to remain. Uh, that's not changing. And uh, on the driveway itself, uh, there'll be a little change from the existing shell to Belgian block and a little addition on the northeast corner of the uh, driveway itself. Uh, I've gone in and out of that driveway and that turnaround isn't substantial enough for you to uh, back a vehicle in and then be able to turn around. So basically the changes to the build the existing building. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, any any questions? Seth. Thank you. So the 117 foot addition 
to the dwelling, that's completely new construction. It's not over like a existing porch or anything. Uh, it will be partially over the existing porch. Uh, you can see if you look very closely at the plan, it shows the steps in the porch that's there right now. Uh, but that porch will be moved out slightly towards the road. Uh, so the uh, the actual ground cover of the uh, building, it's going to change and be added to 117 square feet. Obviously, the porch wasn't included in ground cover under zoning, uh, but um, there is a portion of the porch that's going to be pushed out as well. And that's where the foyer area is. Right now, the kitchen, I guess, is uh, is not substantial enough for their needs, and they needed to push the wall out slightly in order to uh, uh, satisfy what they need uh, for their uh, interior work. You have a follow up, Seth? No. Um, well, the, is there any public input? So, Leo, do you wish to close? I wish to close. Jeff, do we have everything to close? Yes, you do. Would someone like to make a motion to close? So moved. Mark, uh, you moved to close, and Mike, you seconded. So, uh, Mark Beal. Aye. Seth Engelborg. Aye. Ian Golding, aye. Mike Mizzarelli. Aye. Great. Good evening, Leo. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. So uh, that takes us on to amended orders of conditions. And oh, and there are none. So uh, they've all been continued. So uh, we have under orders of conditions, we have uh, 72 Pocomo Road with Brian Madden as a reissue, I believe. Sure, I can take this one if he doesn't get on. They just um, they need to record this order of conditions. Um, you will see right beneath it. There's a certificate of compliance for it because um, they did the work, but it didn't get recorded properly for some reason. And now no one can find the original, so we need to reissue the original so they can record it, and then they'll record the cert right after it and close out the permit. Enough, Brian. Wanted to add anything, but that's kind of it. No, I, I think just it was issued during uh, the early days of COVID when everything was shut down. And so we have no idea what happened to the order. Well, um, so uh, do we, do I need a, a commissioner to move to reissue? So move to reissue. Mike Miserelli motions makes the motion and the second is I'll second. Great, thanks, Seth. So by roll call vote, Mark Beale. Aye. Seth Engelborg. Aye. Ian Golding, aye. Mike Miserelli, aye. So that brings us up to uh, orders of conditions. And I believe Jeff, you sent them out, right? We have certificates of compliance to do. Oh, excuse first. me. I'm sorry about that. Trying to set a record for the briefest meeting of the year. So, sorry, Brian. For, uh, so we have three certificates of, of compliance. Do you want to take them all at once? Sure, I'd be happy to. So this is all for uh, 72 Pacamo. Um, the the first one for 3188 uh, was for a restoration order of conditions um, that was issued in 2019. 
Uh, we've been monitoring it for three plus years now and uh, all the areas that had been previously mowed, uh, if you remember, um, have all restored very nicely and we submitted monitoring reports along the way and, and um, submitted some final photographs as part of that application. The um, second CERT uh, 3292 was for the fenced in garden. That was just the reissue of the order uh, that was completed. And then 3440 was for a new house construction and some other work, new pool. Uh, none of that work took place and we're just looking to close this out um, for no activity. So Jeff, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I would recommend that you can issue all three certificates of compliance. So do I hear a motion to issue all three certificates of compliance? Great. And seconded by Seth. So by roll call vote, Mark Beal. Aye. Jeff Engelberg. Aye. Ian Golding, aye. Mike Miserelli. Aye. So this brings us on to orders of conditions. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, see you. And uh, so we have the uh, first one is Boathouse Realty Trust, 52 Warren's Landing. Uh, yeah, I didn't draft one for this one. Okay. Um, so uh, from the general sense of the commission, I, I think I can review what we talked about for conditions during the hearing but I had a sense of a general positive order on that. And I'll draft that for the 27th, unless people have something specific they wanna add that they didn't mention during the hearing portion. I don't have anything specific, but I assume that there's some uh, protocol that you automatically put in when uh, a bobcat or something's going down onto the beach. Yes. So uh, we usually have conditions for those. So to get onto that beach, I mean, they'll be accessing over an existing, I mean, you can obviously drive a car onto that section of beach there anyways, and then go right to it. Um, but we'll include our provisions that we do that if any, you know, mats need to go down to cover vegetation that they're taking up on a daily basis and uh, that all machinery is stored off of the beach and out of the resource areas. But uh, I imagine that whoever's doing that work will probably get most of the sand moved probably in less than a day. And then the last question, just because I haven't had the experience with somebody like a private homeowner coming in to ask for, uh, is there some sort of automatic monitoring protocol that would go in to see if the beach grass would, um, is doing well? Yeah, we still include, regardless of whether it's a homeowner or a consultant, the basic you know photo monitoring and some sort of survivability to it as well, and just regular updates to the commission on its status. Great, thank you. So um, that brings us on to the Land Bank 16 East Creek Road. And you you, can, you, um, you know, oh, you're not voting and that's just continuing to the 27th, correct? Correct? Right, right. Yeah, Sorry, okay. Terry. <laughs> so, yeah. So we, we have two that we have Jeff sent out um, orders of conditions for us to discuss. And the first one is uh, 16 East Creek Road. So this is our pretty basic version of our invasive species removal orders. But we can certainly make any additions or changes as needed for sure. If anyone has any thoughts. Well, I suppose I have one, Jeff, which is since Rachel volunteered that they were going to use a 3% solution, cutting it down from 
where it says in uh, paragraph 20, the quantity and specific type of herbicide used will be reported in writing. Can we also say the percentage of active ingredient, like the glyphosate? Because I think that's rather, rather interesting and rather telling. Sure, we can, I mean, just bring it up real quickly. I mean, do you think that would be useful going forward? So it changes. I know the, the land bank is offering that. So we have this 19 permits use of glyphosate or equal for use as shown on the label of the specific herbicide. We've talked about this before, and I know they've, they've offered to maybe use less than what the label is. The labeling on herbicides is pretty heavily regulated, and we try not to put out anything that could be contradictory to the directions on the label. Um, maybe if we add it to 19, just to do it. So well, on the package, maybe we'll add the applicant as indicated, no greater than a 3% solution will be used. Any change in this requires notice to the commission. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Chair Golding, were, were, were you suggesting that they use less just for the sake of the product or are we wandering off the label? I'm, I'm just confused what, what we're- Oh, I just thought that it would be a good idea to register the fact that they're only using 3%. They're diluting it from the 50% that, as from what I could tell, the, uh, the label indicates they could use in terms of the concentration. So I thought it was worth noting. I see, I understand. Thank you for the clarification. So just to memorialize that, and, and we could talk about it more, um, certainly. Uh, number 19, Ian, I changed that to read, this order permits the use of glyphosate or equal for use as shown on the label of the specific herbicide. The applicant has indicated no greater than a 3% solution will be used. Any change in this requires notice to the commission. Great. Yeah, that sounds Thank good you. because if, if if she by chance misspoke on the on the solution, at least they can come back and yeah. uh, say differently. Right. Good point. So like I said, I, I try to be cautious on controlled substances like herbicides and pesticides to mess with the the labels and the directions because right. um, that can be problematic for us. I like that change, Mike. Would you like to move to approve as amended, Mark? I would. Do I have a second? Do we have a second? Second. Great. Thank you, Mike. So by roll call, uh, Mark Beal? Aye. Seth Engelborg? Aye. Ian Golding? Aye. Mike Mizzarelli? Aye. Thank you. And that takes us on to 21 Grove Lane. Thanks, so. yes, sir. Thank you. So I don't know if there's a great answer for this or not, but for 21, um, about the disposal. I know we were saying before all material through the landfill, and then there was a question about tree removal. So we added this best practice thing. Um, and if they're so if they're doing like cutting of tree of heaven, some of those trees are probably pretty big. And then I don't know if they're gonna chip them or do what with them. Um, but those those still have to go through the digest digester i think and i know like when we did the japanese black pine work at lindoy nature foundation it's shown that they won't there was there's no issue of like any sprouting through the chips but the tree of heaven <laughs> a little bit more worried about it or maybe we need to look into this i don't think like the chips themselves will obviously germinate, but if there are seed 
if there are seeds mixed in it in with the chips could be issues so i don't i don't know like i, I don't really know the species well enough to make a decision right now and i think it's fine if Jeff, you know, you feel comfortable with the staff approval to do that, or if you prefer it, come back to the commission with how they're going to actually dispose of the tree of heaven. I'm just a little worried that it's a species that hasn't received a lot of management here before, um, and it's going to be difficult to dispose of. So, so to to get to that set, they added to 21 there. It reads just like it did. Then I added one more sentence that says the applicant shall file a disposal plan for the tree of heaven for commission approval. So when they figure out what they want to do, they can send it. We can just do it under like monitoring reports. We'll just post it up separately as other business item. And then they can send in that they're disposing it in a way that won't allow the tree of heaven to spread or proliferate elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sounds like a sensible suggestion well, under the circumstances. Tree of heaven is kind of a total nightmare to deal with. It just heaven is not a good a good name for tree of heaven. So coined by an agnostic, perhaps. So uh, a motion to amend to approve as amended, please. So moved. A second. So uh, thank you. Approved by Seth, uh, seconded by Mike, and by roll call vote, Mark Beal. Aye. Seth Engelborg. Aye. Ian Golding, aye. Mike Miserelli. Aye. Great. So that brings us on to other business. Wait, before we do, I did draft one for Washington Street, or I do have one. If people want to oh. look at that one briefly, I'll pop it up sure. on the screen. All right. So hopefully people can see that. It's kind of our same title block that's there. Um, I don't know. I didn't really have any conditions for this. It seemed pretty straightforward. There's no waivers required for it. It's primarily a flood zone project. I think Seth has a question or a comment. Yes, Seth, if I may. Yes, sorry, I didn't see your hand. That's okay. Um, so I would request that we add one more condition related to the expanded wooden walkway that they're proposing um, to just say that the walkway, wooden walkway should be configured to allow appropriate um, water infiltration so as to not reduce the ability of the land to absorb and contain flood waters. So it's 20, the wooden walkway shall be constructed with proper spacing as to not obstruct the land's ability to retain floodwaters. So I believe there should be a hyphen in lands. The ability, yeah, there we go. A hyphen? In right, apostrophe. Yes, it's the ability of the apostrophe, excuse me. Oh, oh. God. Take me out and shoot me. <laughs> you have me really confused there. I was like, I don't know why there would ever be a hyphen there, but apostrophe, <laughs> yes. I'll give you that one. Hyphen. Uh, oh what do you mean for embarrassing to make these sort of mistakes, elementary grammatical mistakes in public. All right. We'll make so, you diagram uh, sentences after this. So English. I can't even claim it's late <coughs> in the evening. On that note, who would like to ap approve as amended? Make a motion to approve as amended. I'll do that, Mark Beal. Thank you, Mark. A second? Second. Thank you, Mike. So by roll call vote, Mark Beal? Aye. Seth Engelborg? Aye. Ian Golding, aye. 
Mike Miserelli. Aye. Great. So, um, and that moves us on to other business. And uh, perhaps we should wait for approval of minutes until everyone is present. Is do you think that would be a good idea? I do. It's totally up to you guys. Okay. Do we need to make a motion or just continue? You can just hold them to the next meeting. Okay. You you can you can just continue them like you normally do for applications. Thank I'll you, make Barry. that note. Okay. Thank you. So um, discussion of regulatory update. So I left this on there just to remind everyone that we have a meeting scheduled. We're still finalizing that location because we wanted to do that meeting in person. Uh, so we'll send that out well in advance and get it posted well in advance. But to make sure that if people didn't remember that we are having a discussion of the active draft on October 20th. Do we have a time for that meeting yet or not? What's that? Do we have a time yet or just a date? It'll be at five. Okay. So normal time, but uh, we had wanted to do it in person. So we're still figuring out that meeting space. But I'll let everyone know at least a week in advance where it's going to be. Um, let me see. Enforcement actions, potential enforcement <coughs> actions. So just a, a quick update. Uh, we did get contacted by a representative for the enforcement we just issued for two Brock's court. So we'll have a, a full update and some stuff filed for the meeting on the 27th, which is within the time frame that they can have that stuff done by. Thank you. So uh, for reports, uh, I have nothing to report for CRAC, uh, CPC. I need a report. NP and EDC. Nothing to report. So that moves us on to commissioner's comments. And seeing, hearing none, to administrator's staff report. I hope everyone has a nice long holiday weekend. Thanks for the time. <laughs> Seth? Sorry, I do have one question. Um, I waited to see if Jeff would talk about it, but so Jeff, can you talk a little bit about the Harbor Plan Update Committee that's coming and what we'll need to do as a con oh. for that? Oh, thank you, Seth. I completely spaced that out because not everyone was here. So um, for those that don't know, I'll, I'll give my spiel quickly. And I know we, we emailed it to a few people. The Harbor Plan is a plan that the municipality uses for a couple of things. One, it's a local planning document for what's happening in and around the, the Harbor area for both Nantucket and Nantucket Harbors, um, as far as you know, identifying things for fisheries access, for public safety, last one on oil spill response, some level of water quality. <laughs> and those plans are state approved and good for 10 years. We've hit the end of our cycle. Um, it actually came during COVID, so we got an extension and we're, we're opening it back up. But one of the other things that it does that's so important is the town can identify its public use components for things like Chapter 91 licensing through the Harbor Plan. And when Mass Waterways is looking at licenses and license applications, when they're determining proper public use and proper public benefit, they're supposed to consult the Harbor Plan first um, for what those are. So that plan does this, um, but to update the plan before we proceed, we have to form and the state regulation requires the formation of a local committee um, to do and form these plans and update that. Our committee in the past has had a representative of the Conservation Commission. Obviously we have a vested interest in Harbor Health and protection of resource areas around the Harbor. Um, but the other groups involved this time, we have the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board, Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee, NP and EDC has a seat on the board. Um, the Land Bank has a seat on the board this time. Uh, the Marine Trout Association or similar does, so what we'll see, and then there's a few at-large seats. All of the meetings are regular public meetings, um, but it's a, a board that I think we feel has some importance, especially as it helps to frame 
those public access components. So uh, if people have more specific questions, I'm really happy to, to answer those or, or talk to someone one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but I think it was our intent to put on the next agenda when we'd have a, a fuller board for, for people here. And is that next meeting when we would appoint the representative? Yeah, if, if you guys so chose. Are you volunteering, Seth? I am interested in doing it, but I will say I've also expressed my interest in being the representative through NP and EDC. And that meeting will happen before our next meeting. So if I am appointed through NP and EDC, someone else will have to do it through CONCOM. So, and just to go over time requirements is the way it looks like we're doing is the update will probably take about a year from start to finish. Um, what we would be looking at at the start is probably monthly meetings for the first few months. There'll probably be a little lag in the middle where we might go to every two months while well, our contractor, Urban Harbors, is doing a lot of the draft work on the, the plan and the actual writing. And then we'd be back to monthly. So in a year, there will probably be anywhere, I would say, from eight to 10 meetings. And that's probably about it. And they vary in length. So it's not a huge, uh, I would say, of the boards that we have as auxiliary boards, it's probably one of the lighter commitments time-wise and investment time-wise. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. So on that note, the meeting has taken less than an hour. Do I, can I coax a motion to adjourn out of a committee member? Motion, motion to adjourn and congratulations to Chair Golding for <laughs> holding the fastest meeting in history <laughs> under an hour. <laughs> thank you, Mike. <laughs> Actually, I better look out behind her. You're coming along, Ian. <laughs> I'll second the motion. Okay. Seconded by Seth, by roll call vote. Mark Beal. Aye. Seth Engelborg. Aye. Ian Golding. Aye. Mike Mazzarelli. Aye. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the holiday. Thank you, Terry, as always. Well done, I, Ian. Oh well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. Right. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Happy scalping.